Recently I wrote a new book chapter on goal setting for the fourth edition of Physical Management for Neurological Conditions, which is due to be published next year. I'm pretty excited about this chapter because I've included some new content in it that I've not previously written about in my past publications on goal setting in clinical rehabilitation. One issue I raise in this chapter that is the subject of this video is why I find goal attainment problematic as an outcome measure in clinical rehabilitation. In recent times, goal achievement, and in particular one method for goal setting called Goal Attainment Scaling, aka GAS, has risen in prominence as a strategy for individualised outcome measurement in clinical rehabilitation. In the UK, for instance, reporting on GAS scores is currently a core part of the contracted service specifications for rehabilitation involving patients with highly complex needs. Broadly speaking, GAS involves the creation of a multi-point scale, usually with five levels, where each point of the scale represents a different level of achievement of a goal. The midpoint on the GAS scale is the most important point, reflecting a person's expected level of achievement for a particular goal, and this is given a score of zero. Better or worse possible outcomes are then given the scores plus one, plus two, minus one, and minus two around this midpoint. One rehabilitation patient can have multiple goals, in which case at the end of the rehabilitation program these GAS scores can be weighted and combined into a single T-score using this calculation. Goal achievement scaling has gained popularity as an outcome measure for a number of reasons. Rehabilitation patients often present with a wide variety of different kinds of problems which can make it difficult to find one clinical outcome measure that is suitable for all people. GAS scores can convert this heterogeneity into a common metric, a single score of goal achievement. Individualised goal attainment can also be tailored to be sensitive to small changes in outcome that would otherwise be missed by standardised outcome measures such as the Barthel Index or the Functional Independence Measure. There's also appeal in the idea of involving patients in the selection of criteria on which to judge the effectiveness of a programme of rehabilitation, supporting the notion of collaborative rehabilitation design and person-centred practice. But there are a number of criticisms too that have been raised about GAS as an outcome measure. For instance, GAS goals are considered time-consuming to develop, a point which has been addressed in part by the introduction of a gas light approach. Other authors have criticised the T-score itself, T-scores start with the assumption that goal attainment scaling produces interval data, where each step on the scale is equivalent, like centimetre increments on a ruler, when this is not by any means necessarily the case. This assumption is required because it is only meaningful to add, multiply and divide data if it is interval, all of which are employed in calculating T-scores. My main problem with goal attainment scaling is more fundamental, however, and relates to what constructs gas scores actually measure. Changes in scores on a measure of goal achievement reflect two things. Firstly, changes in a person's health functioning or well-being from a baseline state. And secondly, the expectations of the person or people who set the goals. In fact, it is possible for one person to do worse in terms of their rehabilitation outcomes, but score better than another person if the expectations for the first person were initially lower. If health professionals are 100% accurate with their predictions regarding what outcomes patients will achieve, then all patients should always achieve a GAS score of zero, the expected outcome. Indeed, proponents of GAS have stated that when clinicians consistently score above zero, then this should be taken as evidence that these clinicians lack experience or are attempting to massage the GAS scales to make the outcome seem more positive, not that the clinicians or healthcare team is achieving better than average outcomes for their patients. However, a rehabilitation team could be both underambitious and worse than others at delivering therapy, and so consistently score zero as expected on their patients' GAS scales. GAS scores cannot distinguish between substandard therapy oriented towards easily achievable goals and extremely high standards of therapy with very ambitious goals. There are other implications arising from this. For instance, as a rehabilitation team develops an expertise, so too should its expectations for patient outcomes. As such, even if a rehabilitation team improves the quality of its service delivery, its average GAS score ought to remain a steady zero. GAS scores therefore cannot be used to meaningfully benchmark performance between two services, nor within one rehabilitation service over time. Despite these difficulties, there's still value in reflecting on goal attainment at an individual patient level. 
The degree to which a person achieved or did not achieve a particular goal can provide a useful point for discussion for rehabilitation professionals reflecting on their practice as a team or with their patients. Furthermore, when a third party payer, such as an insurance company, is involved in funding an individualised rehabilitation service for one person with a complex presentation, goal attainment can be used as a key performance indicator from a business perspective as part of an individualised outcome oriented funding model. Achieve the goal, get paid. So there you have it. Goal achievement can be informative and can even drive healthcare funding models when used at an individual patient level. But it is difficult to meaningfully compare goal achievement between patients, between services, or even within one service over time. This makes GAS a poor clinical measure to use for research purposes or for benchmarking healthcare services at a population level. Goals do have many other uses, communicating expectations and objectives, enhancing motivation, providing direction for the selection of therapeutic interventions, sharing decision making, but none of these other purposes require goals to be achieved in order for goal setting to be a beneficial clinical activity.